Well, here's a little Bible story that I'm pretty sure you didn't talk about in Sunday school or catechism as a kid. It's, it's one of those untold stories that should maybe come with a parental guidance warning, uh, but, but it doesn't. Because once again, the Bible isn't the warm, fuzzy book we sometimes want it to be or even make it out to be. As we've been learning, if we want to understand the real message of the Bible, we need to recognize that it isn't a book at all. No, it's a library of 66 books with all sorts of different kinds of literature. Then we need to remember that these books and these letters that were preserved for us, this library, it wasn't written to us, just as it tells us, but rather for us. And then in anything you watch or read, context is incredibly important. And context moves well beyond the verse before and after the passage in question. But the whole story of the Bible, the, the kind of literature you're reading, who wrote it, when, and to whom, well, all these things contribute to understanding the real message of the Bible. And then there's the fourth rule that I haven't talked much about just yet, but again, incredibly important. If you want to understand the message of the Bible, you need to understand everything points to Jesus. Old Testament, New Testament, or First Testament, Second Testament, the, the Hebrew Bible, or the New Covenant, whatever you want to call this library, all of it points to Jesus. So when I start to tell you about David, of David and Goliath fame, and mention that he spied his eye on a woman he wanted to marry, but the woman's father, King Saul, wasn't crazy about the idea. And so when David asked King Saul for the daughter's hand in marriage, you might not be aware of King Saul's response because it's an untold story. One we don't tell the kids or preach about in big church very often or ever. First Samuel chapter 18 verses 25 through 27, and, and I quote, The king wants no other price for the bride than a hundred Philistine foreskins to take revenge on his enemies. Foreskins. You can talk to your dad later about what that might actually be, because if you're with your dad right now, he's wishing you were in Kid's Point. The Bible says Saul's plan was to have David fall by the hands of the Philistines. Turns out Philistine men were pretty close to their foreskin, attached, you might even say. And, and therefore, Saul's plan was to see this young man, David, taken out of the picture. But verse 26 says, When the attendants told David these things, he was pleased to become the king's son-in-law. Challenge accepted. I mean, after all, David is thinking, I killed the lion, I killed the bear. And Goliath, what's a hundred Philistines? So, so let's read on. So before the allotted time elapsed, David took his men with him and went out and killed 200 Philistines and brought back their foreskins. Picture it. I mean, try not to picture it. When they counted out the full number to the king so that David might become the king's son-in-law, well, then Saul gave him his daughter in marriage. What the? Who the? Why the? Why is this in the Bible? Welcome to week number six of untold stories, our summer series where we're learning to read, maybe even quote, but really understand what the Bible actually says rather than simply believing what someone wants us to think it says, maybe innocently because they've never taken the time to really understand it themselves or maybe not so innocently because they have their own issues with God or with themselves or 
or some Bible-thumping Christian out there. Increasingly, this old book is being misunderstood, misused, and terribly misquoted. Once loved, cherished, honored, and respected as the good book, in some circles, it's not just out of date, irrelevant, full of fairy tales, or dangerous. No, in, in some circles, it's no longer viewed as the good book at all, but a perverted and twisted evil book. Gather round now, it's story time once again, and it's time to get ready to understand the untold stories of Scripture, seldom spoken about in churches, misunderstood by so many, and yet incredible, powerful passages of Scripture, read directly from your Bible or mine, passages that can be used to tear apart your faith or build it. Let's take a closer look now at King David and his collection of 200 foreskins. First Samuel is in the historical section of the library, and as we learned last week, it's recording what actually happened in history, not recommending it. And this story is preserved for us. It wasn't written to us, but it was written for us. And when we look at the context of this strange and untold story, we notice right away that the Philistine foreskins as a bride price, well, that was King Saul's idea. And if you go back just a few more chapters in this book, you'll see that King Saul is demon-possessed. And this idea? Well, it's a demonic idea. See, the second thing you'll notice is Saul's motive is crystal clear. He's counting on it being pretty tough to get one foreskin, let alone a hundred. Men tend to be fairly protective of that area, and the Philistines were no different. The third thing we find out is that David agrees to this demonic and disgusting dowry and shows off with a double portion, a double delivery, because he knows if he can deliver this dowry, he will get his princess. And every king needs a princess, and David has set his eyes on the prize, the throne. David didn't need to agree. We know that God actually foreordained David to become the king. But nowhere and at no time does the Bible ever indicate that this was how it was supposed to happen. Again, we see like last week, God works in spite of our sin, not because of our sin. And for that, we should be thankful because truth is, we're all sinners. Okay, maybe not the 200 murders and sack of foreskin kind of sinners, but, but there is a point to this story. There is a reason it was preserved for us, perhaps many reasons. We know the type of literature. I've given you the context, but let me tell you at least one thing that's in this story for you, for us. And then remind you that when we're reading the Bible, everything points to Jesus. Okay, now we're just getting sacrilegious or maybe blasphemous. No, nothing could be further from the truth. Inside this story is something for us. We read these stories in our history to learn something important about those who came before us about God, and even about ourselves. Well, what's in a story like that for us? Well, it's the reminder that if God could use a guy like David, if guy, God could forgive a guy like David, if, if eventually it could be said of David that he was a man after God's own heart, well, we're reminded that if God could use him, God can use us. If God could forgive him, God can forgive us, redeem us. See, when we see these stories, we ought to be reminded that the great men and women of the faith 
were not great because of their behavior, but because of their belief. We can call them great men and women of, of the faith because they were forgiven. And if you'll take the time to read the whole book, you'll realize that sin and a messed up world is not something new. We've been in a broken mess for a long, long time. And God is doing everything he can to see us saved and redeemed and in a right relationship with him. See, in Psalm 51, we see David look at his own sin. And there was lots to look at. Not just this story, there's other stories too. Uh, stories where David um, sins greatly, but David did something different with his long list of sin. Something that you and I seem to struggle with, at least sometimes if we're honest. See, David admitted in Psalm 51 his sin. And he admitted that it was sin. In fact, in Psalm 51 verse 4, David cries out to God, against you, you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight. See, the Psalms capture uh, the emotion and the poetry. And David was a, a psalm writer. Da David was caught in adultery, lies, and murder. And it was all catching up with him. But, but instead of justifying his sin, instead of comparing himself with other kings or other people who were even more sinful, or instead of making light of it, he called it what it was. And he admitted that he was a sinner. But he didn't stop there. Psalm 51 records where he also abandons his sin. He stops it. He stopped the adultery. He stops the lies. He stops the murder. How? Well, by abhorring it or absolutely hating his sin. How do you hate lying when you get some gain out of it? I mean, how do you hate adultery if there's some pleasure involved? How, how do you hate murdering when that's how you're getting to the top, when you get ahead, when you get crowned king? Well, you do like David did, and you see where this all eventually leads to. See, sin, when it is conceived, brings forth death. If not your physical death, then most certainly your spiritual death. And it is this sin that brought forth the death of our Lord Jesus Christ. And there he is, once again, as the whole story of the library of the Bible unfolds. We see again and again Jesus, our Savior, Jesus. See, David, even under the old covenant, showed us how to deal with our sin taught us to admit it, to, to abhor it, absolutely hate it, abandon it, because look at where it's going to lead you. I want you just to stop for a moment and, and think about maybe your own struggles with sin. Sometimes we, we buy the lie of the enemy and we think that this is pretty innocent, this isn't going to hurt anyone, when really if we look at where our sin leads, the hurt, the heartache, the addictions, all sorts of, of pain, we look at where it's going to lead instead of the pleasure of the moment, well, we start to see that it's a little easier to, to give it up, to hate it, to abandon it. See, if you read through Psalm 51, you'll, you'll see that David even accepted cleansing for his sin. My mom used to spit shine my face as a little kid. If I didn't do a good job washing my face, uh, you know, she'd get me to wash it or whatever. I'd end up in the back seat of the car. She'd turn around. She'd do an inspection. And, and you know what happened after she spit shined my face a few times? She'd stick her old finger in her mouth and she'd, she'd try to get going there. I, 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 after she did that just a few times, I got better at washing my face myself. Listen to me for a second. No matter what you've done, who you've done, where you've been, what you've seen, what you've said, or how long it's been, let me challenge you to do like the man after God's own heart did. 
just to God, admit your sin. Abhor, hate your sin. Uh, abandon your sin. It's time to give up on it. Just look at where it's going to lead you. And then accept a good scrub down. Accept cleaning for your sin. And when you do, you'll see how even the characters of the Old Testament, they were pointing us to Jesus, the loving, the accepting, the, the forgiveness of God. It's a library, not a book. It's written for us, but not to us. Context counts a lot, and everything in it points to Jesus. The grass withers, and the flowers fall, but the word of our God endures forever. Let me pray with you. Father God, we pause just for a moment here, and, and we look sometimes at, at the scriptures and just say how strange and how confusing and yet we know that, that some of these books are simply recording history and, and God, you're not recommending that we repeat those things. But yet, thank you for recording who these people really were. That, that even though that these great men and women of the faith, that they were just so much like us. God, thank you for the reminder that we've all sinned, but none of us have sinned too far to be forgiven. God, in this moment, whether we're listening in at home or wherever we might be, God, we just pause and we admit that we've sinned, that we've fallen short of the perfect goodness of God. We want to stop the sinning. We want to uh, abandon it. And so God, help us to hate it. Help us to look at where these things are really going to lead to. The, the broken hearts, the ruined lives, the loneliness. God, there, there is a better way and we want to go your way rather than our way. Father, forgive us for our sin. For, forgive us for doing things so often our way rather than your way. And God, we pray that you would just help us to get a good wash down. Clean us up, O oh God. Uh, cleanse us from our sin and help us to, to get that right the first time so that you don't have to scrub so hard or so, so that it won't hurt. God, I pray for every person listening right now that the, as you bring our sin to our attention, God, don't just allow us to feel guilty and bad and heavy and accused. But God, this day I pray in the name of Jesus, you'd help us to do what the Bible tells us to do and to confess our sins to you, that to receive forgiveness for this sin. And so right now, that's what we do. We receive, we receive your forgiveness. We accept your cleansing. We're ready to stop the sinning. We hate where it's going to lead. And we admit it's time for a new day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.